Well, as we come to this time now for us to prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper, uh, there is no better way for our hearts to be made ready than for God's Word by His Spirit to make us ready. And I want you to take your Bibles and be turning to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. It's difficult to make choices on a Lord's Supper Sunday evening like this not because it's hard to find a passage, but because there are so many passages that speak to the death of Christ for us. And as I have searched the Scripture these past several days, my heart has been drawn to 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. I want to begin by reading first this passage of Scripture, verses 7 through 10, right in the heart of this epistle, that these verses speak so directly to the conquest and to the triumph of Christ at the cross for our sins. And I would remind us, as we shall look at these verses tonight, that before we were saved, we were all children of the devil. Uh, we were born in enemy territory. We were born on the wrong side of this conflict. We were born children of Satan and children of darkness. And there was no way that we could free ourselves to come to God. Uh, there was no way that we could escape the tyranny of Satan and the rule of the devil in our lives. And the purpose of Christ coming into this world, amongst many different reasons, was to deal a devastating blow to Satan and a devastating blow to the devil to free his grip of us that we might be released from Satan's uh, tyranny and his rulership, that we might come into the kingdom of God. And so as Christ came, he came for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil so that we might be set free and to come into God's kingdom. Uh, it always amazes me people who think that they could come to God through their own efforts and through their own religion. And they do not understand the grip that their life is in Satan, and Satan will not let go. And it was only through the cross of Jesus Christ, only in his coming into this world was, uh, was the devil utterly defeated by Christ, and we have now been set free to come into the kingdom of God. And so as we come to take the Lord's Supper, my desire is that these verses would remind us of this great victory of Christ on our behalf, as he literally came into this world and entered the devil's battleground. He came into this world to step onto the devil's turf and to take back from Satan what rightfully belongs to himself by creation. So 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, this will be our focus tonight. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin, meaning he cannot practice sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God... And the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. These verses spell out for us in very clear and unmistakable um, explanation the mission of Christ coming into this world. And we could certainly assign many different reasons why Christ came into this world. 
But at the apex of all of those reasons, it was he came to secure eternal redemption for his people, and he came to free us from the grip of Satan. Let's look at these verses. And as we do, I want you to see them under three headings with me tonight. I want you to see the contrast in verse 7 in the first part of verse 8. And then the conqueror in verse 8b. And then finally, I want you to see the change in verses 9 and 10. Uh, let's begin with the contrast in verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8. He begins by saying, little children, and as Paul says this, uh, there's a pastor's heart in the Apostle John. Uh, as he expresses in terms of endearment, his, his fond affection for the believers, for the brothers and sisters in Christ. He is the aged apostle. He is the last living apostle. He is probably in his 90s at this point. It has been some 60 years since Christ has suffered and bled and died upon the cross, and he is now the elder statesman of Christianity. And so as he writes this, he begins by saying, little children, all believers were little children to uh, this apostle who is in his 90s. But he, he, he begins to pour his heart out to us, and he sounds a word of, no, of warning. He says, make sure no one deceives you. And the reason he says that is because, as you know, there were false teachers already beginning to circulate, to make the circuit from church to church and from town to town, and they were spreading their false gospel and their false message. And at this particular time, there was a false teaching that was referred to as Gnosticism which was a very complicated, philosophical um, teaching that took uh, the truth of Scripture, but it, also, but it then added to it uh, many damnable lies, such that the truth of Scripture was no longer the truth of Scripture. Uh, they took the words that were being used, but assigned their own meanings to it, and it created a, a false dualism. Uh, between the spiritual and the physical, and it said that all that was physical is evil and all that is spiritual is good. Therefore, it doesn't matter how you live in your body. It doesn't matter uh, your conduct, what goes on in your body. All that matters is the spiritual. And it just opened uh, a massive door in the church for people when they heard this to have the impression that they could live however they wanted to live, and the course of their life really was not important. And it's called license. And they felt that they had a license now to come to church and uh, to sit under the teaching, but then go back out into the world and live however they wanted to live. And so John sounds this note, little children, make sure no one deceives you. He has already said that in verse 26 of uh, of chapter 2, he says, These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And so there were these wolves among the flock, among the sheep, who were trying to deceive uh, the true believers. And, of course, the true believers ultimately cannot be deceived. And one reason why God allows false teachers to circulate is they suck off the false believers out of the church. And it's an amazing thing in the wisdom of God how he actually uses false teachers and false teaching to pull away those uh, who claim to be Christians, but in reality are not, and the false teachers serve a purpose of actually purifying the church. Nevertheless, so that their faith would not be disrupted, John addresses this issue. The issue being that if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, that you will uh, manifest a righteous life and a pursuit of holiness in your life, and there are no exceptions. And that's why it says in verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. Now, here is the antidote for the deception. Here is what they need to never forget. They were hearing the opposite of this from the false teachers. 
the one who practices righteousness is righteous, meaning is saved. You can know the one who is truly saved because they are charting a course with their life in the pursuit of righteousness and holiness. So that's what he is saying here. Now under that, I want to begin by drawing your attention to the contrast. And in the contrast, here we see that there are only two groups of people in all the world. And there are those who are of God, and there are those who are of the devil. And certainly, if you have been around this church any length of time, that has been reiterated time and time again. Uh, that, in fact, there are only the saints and the ain'ts. Uh, there are only those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ, and there are no other categories of people in the world. Now, he gives us the first category in verse 7, which would be those who do know Christ in a personal way. He says, the one who practices righteousness. Stop right there. This is the true believer. This is the one who genuinely knows Christ in their hearts. They are practicing righteousness. Now, this does not mean that they are sinlessly perfect. This does not mean that they do not continue to sin. They do. In fact, earlier in this book, in chapter 1, verse 8, John wrote, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But for the one who has been born of God, there is a new direction for that life. There is a new path that that life is uh, undertaking, and it is a path whereby one is practicing righteousness. And this speaks of lifestyle. This speaks of habitual conduct. This speaks of the main or major characteristic of that person's life. And everyone who has been genuinely born again from above now is practicing righteousness. Uh, they have God's divine nature within them, and there is this new fruit that is being produced in their lives. And so he says, the one who practices righteousness, and the word righteousness in this case really is a synonym for holiness. Uh, the word righteousness means conformity to a standard, that standard being the character of God and the word of God. And so the one who is practicing, who practices righteousness, he says, is righteous. And what that means, the one who is practicing righteousness has been declared righteous by God in justification. What this verse is doing is connecting inseparably two tremendous doctrines justification and sanctification. Justification is we have become righteous in the sense that we have been declared the righteousness of Christ by God. That has been charged to your account. And everyone who has been declared righteous at the moment of salvation, and that is a forensic declaration by God, Everyone who has been justified now begins the pursuit of practicing righteousness. It's impossible to be declared righteous and then your life continue to practice sin. The one who is righteous practices righteousness. That's what John is saying. It's a very profound truth. And he goes on to say, so much so, at the end of verse 7, just as he, referring to Christ, is righteous. And so there is now the declaration of Christ's righteousness to us, as well as now the pursuit of a practical righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is so much theology that is concentrated and contained in verse 7. It is a very profound verse. It is able to say in but a few words some, some uh, great unsearchable truth. So this is the first uh, category of people in the world 
They are the ones who are practicing righteousness, and they are righteous just as Jesus is righteous. Now, there is another category. There is a contrast. There is a second group. And in verse 8, John clarifies for us. He says, the one who practices sin is of the devil. This tells us right here that those who are outside of Christ, those who have not been declared righteous, they are of the devil, meaning the devil has them in his grip. The devil is is blinding their eyes. The devil is at work in their life. The devil has their heart in his grip, and the devil has them in bondage and in blindness. The devil has them in a, in a, in a lost state from which they cannot escape. And he says, this one who is of the devil practices sin. There is this ongoing desire to sin. There is this ongoing lust for sin. Uh, and when that sin is practiced, uh, there is no sense of, uh, of guilt. There is a sense of pleasure as they continue to go further and further down this path. And he says that it has to be this way, for in verse 8, the devil has sinned from the beginning. From father to child, there is this passing down of of family, uh, of family traits. And the devil himself is the first one to sin. Therefore, everyone who is of the devil will do the same. Everyone who is of the devil will practice sin because the devil was the originator of sin and the devil was the first one to sin. When you, can, when you go home, you can look up these verses, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, and Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11, I think it goes through verse uh, 15 and 16. These, those two sections, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, take us back before uh, Adam and Eve ever sinned and take us back to the throne room of God when Lucifer, the son of the morning, was standing in the presence of God and when pride was first found within him, and he sought to rise, to raise himself up above the throne of God and to draw the angels after him to worship him. So he is very skilled in gathering other people to follow him in a course of sin. How good is the devil? I'll tell you how good he is. That a third of the angels who were in the throne room in the very presence of God before that, that throne of glory, the devil was able to convince a third of the angels to turn their backs on the glory of God and come worship him and follow him. That's how good the devil is. And so therefore, down in this world, those who are of the devil, he has extraordinary power to be able to lead them away from God and lead them into further sin. And everyone who is not born again from above belongs to the devil and is under the control of a real personal devil. And parents, until your children are converted and until they come to faith in Christ, one main reason for their disobedience is they continue to be of the devil. And they continue to need to be set free from a personal devil in order to humble themselves under your authority and to follow the direction that they should go. That's how real the devil is. And so we have this contrast between those who are practicing righteousness and those who are practicing sin, those who are of God, and those who are of the devil. And so, therefore, the need that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ to set us free from the works of the devil. So we come in the middle of verse 8, second, to the conqueror or to the conquest. And it speaks of the work of Christ. The Son of God, referring to none other 
then the second member of the Godhead, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God appeared for this purpose. He appeared referring here to his entrance into this world through the womb of a virgin, born unlike everyone else who has entered into this world, born not of the devil, but born a virgin birth. He appeared for this purpose. He came on a mission. He came for a reason specifically, and it says, to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil to, to blind the eyes of the unbelieving. The works of the devil to keep people who are lost in estrangement toward God. The works of the devil to paralyze the will of unbelievers so that they cannot believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to take you to some verses that I think will help uh, uh, expand upon this. Come back to Genesis chapter 3, if you would, and verse 15, the very first mention of Jesus Christ in the Bible. The very first direct mention of Christ in the Bible. Uh, Genesis 3 and verse 15. It's called the proto euangelion which means the first mention of the gospel. Here it is in Genesis 3, verse 15. And I want you to see how this is, how this is described for us. The first mention of the gospel in the Bible is pictured as Christ coming to destroy the devil and wield a death blow to the devil. Genesis 3, verse 15. This is part of the curse. Jesus, or God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, he is addressing this to the serpent. Verse 14, the Lord said to the serpent, he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, right there, there is a statement of spiritual warfare at the very dawn of of redemptive history. There would be the seed of the devil and there would be the seed of the woman. And the seed of the devil refers to all those who would be born into this world under the captivity of Satan. But he also refers to the seed of the woman and this points ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ himself who would be born of a woman, Mary, Galatians 4.4, he was born of a woman in the fullness of time, under the law. Now, here's what would happen when Christ would come. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. What a struggle would take place when he would come. There would be direct conflict, and there would be hand-to-hand -hand, uh, fighting that would go on between Christ and between the devil when Christ would come into this world and the devil would bruise the Lord Jesus Christ upon his heel. And it refers to uh, uh, the, the opposition of Christ, uh, of the devil against Christ when he came into this world ultimately at the cross. As Satan was the one who was inciting the Jewish leaders, he was the one who was revving up the crowd that day to cry out, crucify him, crucify him, and to release Barabbas. Satan was the one who was behind that, inciting the passions of that crowd that day to rise up in anarchy and to put to death the only perfect man who ever came into this world. Satan did that. Satan did that. And Jesus understood that when he was in the upper room. And in John 14, verse 31, after Judas had left, Jesus makes comment that now the devil is making his way to the upper room. And it was a time of satanic activity there at the end. But upon that cross, Jesus would do something upon that cross that would have eternal significance for you and for me. And he says in verse 15, he says, he shall bruise you on 
the head. Far worse to be bruised on the head than to be bruised on the heel. And to be bruised on the head is fatalistic. To be bruised on the head is to wield the blow in such a way that it, that it devastates and renders powerless the one who has been subjected to such a blow. That is what Jesus Christ did upon the cross for us. We were of the devil, and we were in bondage to the devil before we came to faith in Jesus Christ. And through Christ's atoning work and through his victory at the cross, he crushed the head of the serpent and of Satan such that we might be set free to enter into the kingdom of God. Let me show you some other verses. Come to the Gospel of John, if you would. John chapter 12 and verse 31. Jesus declared this before he went to the cross. In John chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus, looking ahead to his death upon the cross, said, Now judgment is upon this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. It would be through his death upon that cross when he was lifted up to die that he would cast down the devil and men and women would be liberated and set free to be drawn to himself through his death upon the cross. Come to John 16 and verse 11. And Jesus said that this is at the heart of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to come into this world and to convict men, beginning in verse 8, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. I tell you, the Holy Spirit of God is an old-fashioned preacher. The Holy Spirit of God has come not to tickle felt needs. The Holy Spirit of God has come not to stroke the egos of the unbelieving. The Holy Spirit of God has come not to pamper the flesh. The Holy Spirit of God has come to bring an indictment to the hearts of the world and to indict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he goes on to expound this concerning sin because they do not believe in me. This is the, the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit in the heart of those who are lost to convict them and to convince them of the sin of unbelief that they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and to clarify where they stand with Christ. That there would be no ambiguity in the heart of the lost. That the Holy Spirit would bring into focus in the heart of the one who is lost the fact that they have not yet come to faith in Christ. You're lost. You're lost. You're lost. And then the implications in verse 10. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see, and you no longer see me. What this is saying is the Holy Spirit of God is convincing the hearts of all who are lost that the only way you can go to God is to have a perfect righteousness. You cannot arrive there with your own righteousness. There is only one way to come to God. And that is through the perfect righteousness that Christ alone can provide. And if a person continues in unbelief, verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. And that speaks to the cross. And that speaks to the work of Christ who came to destroy the works of the devil at the cross. And here's the implication. If the devil is judged, if the devil has come under the judgment of God, and he has, my friend, at the cross, how much more all of those who have the devil as their father, who have not yet been saved, 
if God has brought judgment to the greatest of the rulers of the kingdom of darkness, how much more all the lower imps in the kingdom of darkness? If Satan himself will not pass the judgment of God, Neither will any lost person who continues to reject Christ. And this is the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, to convict men of sin and righteousness and judgment. Adrian Rogers says it's the work of the Holy Spirit that when the gospel is being preached, the Holy Spirit is walking up and down the aisles of the church, tapping people on the shoulder and saying, whispering in that ear, he's talking to you, that this is the truth, and you're lost, and you need to be saved. You're just an old lost church member who's never been born again, and you do not have the righteousness of God, and there is a judgment that's awaiting you. And the preacher may have a smile on his face, and there may be flowers on the offertory, and there may be wonderful music being played, but there is a smoke alarm that's going off in the human heart that is telling you, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. And so that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And at the heart of that, verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, who is that? That's Satan, has been judged. And it's put in the past tense, although it will happen the next day, to certify how certain it is that this will occur. We'll come to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're thinking about how Christ appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and in verse 4, we see the reality of this of the power of Satan upon, the, uh, upon unbelievers. Beginning in verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And the veiling of the gospel is that one's eyes are closed to their personal need for this message of salvation. Uh, they hear the gospel being preached and they're thinking, oh, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this tonight. And it is the devil who continues to keep those eyes covered over and to keep a person lost. Verse 4, in whose case the God of this world, who is that? Small g, that's the devil himself. Notice what he has done. Has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. How many of the unbelieving? All of the unbelieving. So that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Listen. I can stand up here and hold forth a torch, but if you're blind, you still don't see it, right? It doesn't matter how bright and how blazing is the light. If you are blind, you can't see it. And when the gospel is presented and the truth goes forth, people who are blinded by the devil, they cannot put one plus one equals two together spiritually and see their own personal need for salvation. Come to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13 speaks to now how Christ has appeared for this purpose to deliver us out of Satan's kingdom. And in Colossians 1 verse 13 we read, For he, referring to Christ, rescued us. And when someone is rescued, that means they're delivered from great peril and great danger. Christ rescued us from the domain of darkness. That, that means our lost estate. And it was a domain of darkness because Satan blinded our eyes. And we were living in darkness, spiritual darkness. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness 
of sins. That's what Christ did for us. He descended from heaven and He entered into this world. We were in the domain of darkness and He Himself personally upon that cross rescued us and saved us and delivered us. And I want to say again, this does not say that he made, he, he made us potentially, possibly rescuable and that He did not hypothetically deliver us or potentially save us. It says that He actually accomplished something upon that cross as a stated fact. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. He came and rescued His people. Look at Colossians 2 and verse 15. Colossians 2 and verse 15. And I just want to give you this one last verse to, to give us a flavor for this. That in mentioning the cross, there is this repeated emphasis upon the warfare and upon the conflict. And that through the cross, Christ defeated the devil and therefore won our salvation. Colossians 2 and verse 15, and this is one of those, we need to start in verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, the uncircumcision of your flesh means that your heart was not yet broken towards God. Uh, you, you had not yet, the Spirit of God had not yet cut your heart in a, in a step of circumcision, whereby you would be convicted of your sin and brought to Christ. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him. And that alludes to His resurrection. And that when Christ was raised from the dead, all who were in Christ were raised with Him also. And we were, if you were, in His loins. And when Christ was raised from the dead, He made us alive together with Him. He won that for us in His resurrection. Having forgiven us all our transgressions. Verse 14. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Stop right there. All of your sins that you have ever committed in the entirety of your life from the moment you were born all the way to the end of your life to the moment that you die. All of those sins, your sins of omission and your sins of commission, your sins where you didn't do what you should have done and those sins whereby you did what you should not have done. And all of your sins, not only of action, but also of attitude, and also of motive. All of our sins, not only by deed, but, but sins by tongue as well. They were all nailed to the cross. God took all of our sins and nailed them to the cross, and that is the reference to the certificate of debt. And all of our sins inscribed, if you will, upon that certificate of debt. And Christ died personally for every single one of our sins upon the cross. And so He canceled out. That means to write across that certificate of debt a statement of cancellation, meaning they have been dealt with. They have been paid in full. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He paid in full. He canceled out our certificate of debt. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. So He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which were hostile to us. And all of our sin condemned us before a holy God. And He has taken it out of the way. He has taken our sins far away. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgression. 
He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And it speaks here of how Christ dealt with our sin intentionally and directly and painfully. As He was nailed to the cross, our sins were nailed to the cross and He became one with our sin, and He bore our sin in His body upon that cross. And as He died in our place, and as He shed His blood, He canceled out our certificate of debt. Now, that, all that is to say, verse 15. Now, something else was going on at the cross. Invisible to the human eye but far more real than what the naked eye could see that day. Pull back the curtains and see into the invisible world of the heavenlies. Verse 15, When He had disarmed, that means stripped and subdued, when He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, that's not speaking to Rome. That's not speaking of the Jewish leadership. That is speaking of that prince of darkness himself, Lucifer. It is speaking of Satan and his leadership in his kingdom of darkness. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through Him. And the background, the image of this, as Paul is conveying the spiritual truth to this, is the Roman triumphant procession, whereby a Roman general would leave Rome, and he would be assigned soldiers with him, and go to a far distant land, and there go into direct conflict on foreign soil, with a, a foreign nation, and there utterly defeat that foreign nation and win the spoils of victory. And he would then take the generals and whoever were in leadership of that defeated nation or country and lead them back to Rome and go marching triumphantly down Main Street in Rome all the way to Caesar's temple. And the people would turn out and they would line both sides of that, of that central road. And they would cry out with their hosannas, not their hosannas, they would cry out with their cheers as the conquering general would come marching back. He would have his soldiers behind him and then chained to his chariots would be the leaders of the conquered kingdom that had come under now his domain. And he would literally drag them down the main street and bring them up to Caesar's temple and present them as these leaders who had been utterly devastated through his victory. That is the background of verse 15. That going on in the invisible spiritual world as Jesus died physically, there was a spiritual triumph that was taking place. And on that cross, as Jesus bore our sin, and as He came under the wrath of God, He won the victory for us. And this says that He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He utterly stripped them and He shamed them and He subdued them, and He defeated them at Calvary's cross so that you and I could walk away and walk out of that skirmish and enter into His own kingdom. That's what Christ did for us upon the cross, my friend. And when you look at the cross, there is far more going on than the physical agony. And we hear about uh, The Passion of Jesus, this movie Mel Gibson has done that will soon be released. And I understand it's a good movie. There's far more going on than The Passion of Christ. There's far more going on 
than simply him dying a death physically. There were some 40,000 people who were crucified on crosses. The greatest event of Calvary that was taking place was what you could not see with your naked eye. As your sin and my sin was being laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and as He took our sin upon Himself, He crushed the head of the devil. And He disarmed the rulers and authorities. And He said, now the prince of this world is cast down. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to Myself. This is the victory. This is the conquest. And the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. My friend, you and I are part of the spoils of Calvary. We are the fruit of His work. We are the trophies of His grace by which He has won for all time the victory on our behalf. Finally, I want you to see the change in 1 John. And we're finished. What a change this victory at the cross has won for us. Verse 9 of 1 John 3, the change. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in Him. You can't go to the cross and for your life not to be changed. You can't go to Calvary by faith and to enter into the blood of Christ without your life being transformed from the inside out. No one who is born of God practices sin. He may sin individually, but he cannot habitually practice sin because his seed abides in him. And this seed refers to the divine nature that is put within us. We now have a new mind. We now have a new heart. We now have a new will. We now have a new nature within us. The old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Verse 10, Therefore, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. It is obvious because of the habitual practice and direction and pursuit and passion of an individual life. For those of us who have been to the cross, for those of us who have believed upon Jesus Christ unto eternal life, the works of Satan in our life of unbelief, the works of Satan in our lives of depravity have been defeated. And there is now a new nature within us. And we now have the victory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. For all who are truly Christians, we have entered into the victorious life. The mere fact that we are saved, we have entered into the victory of Christ upon that cross. And greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. So as we come to take the Lord's Supper tonight, we are reminded that before we came to faith in Christ, we were enemies of God. We were children of the devil. We were blinded by Satan. We were entrenched in deeds of darkness whether by active rebellion or passive indifference, our life was characterized by deeds of darkness. We were unable to save ourselves. We were unable to come to God. 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26 even says that we were held captive by the devil to do his will. 
even our wills were paralyzed by Satan and kept us from doing what God would want us to do. And yet Christ 2,000 years ago entered this world and He went to the battlefield and He went to the front lines of the battle. He went to the cross and there as the general of His people, the captain of His own people, He there died as our leader, as our representative. And as David defeated Goliath and won a victory for all of the people of God, so Christ, the greater David, rose up against the greater Goliath, the devil. And through that death upon the cross, our Christ, the greater David, won a victory for all God's people who put their trust in Christ alone. So as we take the Lord's Supper tonight, may we be reminded that without Christ, our lives are defeated, our lives are doomed, our lives are damned. But with Christ, we've been rescued, we've been delivered, we've been saved, and the victory of Christ is now our Christ, is now our victory through Him who suffered for us. Let's pray. Our Father, we do not enter into this time lightly, but in our hearts we think of that conflict upon the cross as Satan was there tempting Christ to come down from the cross, even through those voices that called out to Him, come down from the cross, save yourself, the taunts of the devil himself to Christ. Lord Jesus, we praise You tonight that You were so resilient in that day of battle that you persevered with all hell unleashing its artillery against you, that you would not sound retreat, that you would not withdraw from the skirmish, but that you gave yourself unto death in that day of battle upon Calvary. And in that day of battle you won for us an eternal victory over the devil and over our sin and over death and every enemy that our soul knows. We thank you for the sufficiency of that victory and the supremacy of that victory over our sin and over Satan and over death. And so tonight as we come to the Lord's table, we are reminded that we live in victory. We worship in victory. We serve in victory. The victory of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we hold the cup and as we hold the bread, may we revel in the victory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May there be, even within our own hearts, shouts of, of acclamation, that Christ has been victorious on our behalf and has utterly routed the devil and captured him and crushed his head and disarmed him and subdued him and cast him down and through that victory has now lifted us up. Lord, we praise you for this that there is now therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.